Y'all know me. Know how I earn a living. This shark, swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. You find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell shark, we've got a panel on our hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're going to need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Here we are back again, once more in the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. And this is a special episode, episode 27, a reading from the Book of Quint. Why are we doing this? Because we have a celebration uh, going on. We have reached our campaign funding goal over on Indiegogo.com. The campaign goal has been reached. With eight days left, we are now 104% of our $3,000 initial goal. And those of you who might be hearing this for the first time, a quick rundown is that here at the Jaws Obsession, we've been working on the Book of Quint, which is a novel detailing the backstory to Quint from Jaws. About two months ago, at the beginning of May, we launched a campaign to allow listeners to the Jaws Obsession to come on board and sponsor the project of which they will be receiving the Book of Quint when it is completed in October of 2022. This is not an official publication. What this is is a way of getting this book off the ground so that it can be considered for an official publication. So we don't know what's going to happen ultimately to this, the Book of Quint. But what we do know is that the people that are that have came on board as sponsors to this project and have supported this project, they will be getting the Book of Quint. And they will be able to read the, this novel, which has been, uh, which I have been working on for the, uh, over two years now. And what Indiegogo is going to do now is, uh, where there's eight days left in the initial campaign window, but now that it is uh, passed, it is now 104% funded. It is now going to go into in-demand status. They are going to allow people and backers to still come on board for the rest of the summer, which is kind of nice for anyone that was maybe had second thoughts or was hanging out, seeing if this thing was actually going to get completed. There's still time. There's still time to go to bookofquint.com or jawsob.com. Follow the Book of Quint page. Uh, you can get links to the first chapter. You can get links to the video, the promotional video on YouTube, as well as the link over to indiegogo.com slash project slash the Book of Quint. With eight days left, Yesterday morning, I finished chapter 36 of the book. We're now well over 300 pages. Uh, it's headed towards 400 pages. We still have an editing phase to finish up. Editing has already begun on the first half of the book, and it's it's like a continued process. While it's being written, it's being edited at the same time. Uh, the book cover, then there's going to be a book cover design phase to get to all before September. It's a lot to juggle. It's a lot. To, there's a lot of plates spinning. We're trying to keep them going at the same time. 
Uh, but we have big shoulders here at the Jaws Obsession. We can shoulder this responsibility. We are just happy that you keep tuning in. So I wanted to do something different today. I wanted to do. I wanted to see how this plays out. So I'm going to have to ask your feedback afterwards. But what we're going to do as a celebration, I'm going to read an excerpt from the Book of Quint, and we're going to see how that plays because we don't know where it's going to go. But the fact is, is that it's here and now. What I wanted to do here was as a little bit of a celebration for all of you who have been listening. And for, I need to say a huge thanks to those that jumped on board Indiegogo.com and actually backed the campaign and pushed it to this level, which is um, very appreciative because um, without you, the Jaws fans, you're not, that you're showing that there is a demand for the prequel to Jaws. And that is what we are trying to trigger here. And there are things in motion, which are nice to know. It would be nice to uh, get updates on those. And when I have updates on them, I can share them with you when I'm allowed to. However, right now, what we have is the Jaws Obsession, where we can actually talk about all things Jaws. What we have here is we have fresh Jaws material coming into the world. I remember John Tedder said last week in one of the episodes, uh, John said that it's not stagnant anymore. And that's true, is that when I read this, I hope that everybody can see what's coming into a reality here is that there is more to the Jaws universe that's being introduced here. And the movie Jaws only gets that much more special when we expand on the Jaws universe. It's very exciting to even be doing this episode and being able to read fresh new Jaws material and to actually bring in some more entertainment where we actually can talk and actually dive deep into the characters of Jaws. So this is an exciting moment for me as well. So I'm happy to be here. So let's let's get to it. Let's see if we can get some music on. The first part of the book is all about the last day in the water for the survivors of the USS Indianapolis tragedy, which would be Thursday, August 2nd, 1945. So the events that happen on that final day is what is is what is being detailed in the first part to the book of Quint. And that's where we are going to lead right into that. If you, everyone wants to read the first chapter to the Book of Quint, you can go to jawsob.com, bookofquint.com, and you'll be able to read there uh, the posted first chapter of, book of the Book of Quint. This is now five chapters later, so this is going to be eight pages from Chapter 6, the Book of Quint. Chapter 6, The Crate. Boyd held on to the side of the floater net and perked up at the sight of a wooden crate that floated just off to the south, about 20 feet away. The wooden crate seemed to bounce to its own rhythm with the ocean swells rolling underneath it. Say, fellas, I got an idea here. We gotta get that crate. Under the water, Lloyd unraveled the length of survival line he wrapped around his knife's handle. Chester Eastman looked out at the wooden crate that Boyd was staring at. Forget it, that's too far, Troy. Those rat bastard sharks will take you before you get out there. It's only 25 feet. I can make it. There might be food in it. Boyd shifted his life jacket down from his face. Besides, it's the wooden crate I want. We are only down to one knife, and Oscar will be back. Boyd took the length of line and handed one end to Jack, who was holding onto the floater net. Turning to his left, Boyd held up his knife to Quint. Even though he never verbalized it, Quint felt an older brother's sense of protection over Boyd. They were both gunner's mates and only met a year ago when Boyd first reported to the ship. Two ranks below and five years younger than Quint, Boyd kept to a different group of sailors. During port calls, they would both go their separate ways, but underway, Quint was in charge of Boyd. During general quarters, they both manned the port side aft quad 40 millimeter Bofors, an anti-aircraft gun station. Boyd was the fastest loader Quint had ever worked with, and Quint was the most confident operator Boyd had ever seen. Together, they handled six kamikaze planes shot down off of Iwo Jima, and another three during the Battle of Okinawa. During the early morning hours, towards the end of the Navy's Okinawan invasion, Quint jolted awake at the controls of his gun turret to Boyd screaming, Oscar, Oscar, port side! The kamikaze fighter had sneaked up on them in just 12 seconds under cover of darkness, but at the last minute, a hint of light off the horizon betrayed him. Quint leaned into the controls and the mechanized motor swung the four barrels of the anti-aircraft weapon around and straight up at the diving Japanese plane. The movement was so quick and fast that Quint's hearing protection had fallen off his head. He didn't hesitate to press the trigger and fire off the 40 millimeter rounds in perfect aim at the target. Boyd looked up to see the rounds from their gun station being the first to meet the plane, followed by the tracers from the other portside weapons that equipped the USS Indianapolis. 
The covering fire laid out across the sky and caused the kamikaze fighter to veer off course away from the bridge of the Indianapolis and head straight down at them. Concussive blasts of the guns pounded on their bodies. A storm of hot brass casings rained down against their legs. Boyd pressed his headset closer to his head to further muffle the sounds and looked up to see the blood coming from Quint's ear as his eardrum ruptured. Quint didn't flinch. He kept the trigger squeezed and fired off the last rounds, trying to sway the aim of the heavy guns into the diving plane. Those precious last-second rounds caused the kamikaze to bank hard from its original target of the bridge where the captain stood. The plane exploded in a fiery crash against the port side of the ship's stern, but not before the doomed enemy pilot released a bomb at a height of 25 feet above their heads. Quint dove to the side, grabbed Boyd, and held him down as the bomb broke through the deck right next to their station, sending shrapnel and metal exploding across their backs. Eyes squeezed shut, they waited for the flames to consume them, but to their surprise the bomb never exploded on impact, instead dropping through the decks below and out through the keel, detonating beneath the ship on the sea floor. They picked themselves up, dusted off, reloaded, and watched for more enemy planes while the damaged control crews secured the flooded compartments and kept the Indianapolis alive. Boyd never forgot what Quint did at the end of those 12 seconds it took for the kamikaze and its bomb to reach them. As the damaged Indianapolis sailed back across the Pacific to get repairs back home, Boyd felt as though Quint was his big brother watching over him. He never mentioned it to Quint, but he wanted to return the favor if ever the opportunity arose. This was his chance. Boyd looked at Quint and handed him the bowie knife. You were always good to me, Quint. If I don't get back, use this to kill Oscar. Give it to him for me. Boyd pushed the knife over with a half smile. Quint shook his head. I can't let you go. You can and you will. We gotta try something. Boyd held the knife to Quint's life jacket. Quint reached up from the water and took the knife, then nodded his head. They were all too weak to resist each other. There was no holding anyone back at this point. Boyd was right. Boyd looked out at the crate drifting further away. You boys hold on tight to this line and pull me back when I say so. Eastman and Jack both acknowledged the order by clenching onto the end of the line with their free hands, and Boyd let go of the floater net. He sucked in a few quick breaths, looked around the water for signs of fins and movement below, then leaned forward and struck out at the sea with his tired arms. The men watched as Boyd pressed on through the water. His swimming form broke down into a desperate crawl forward with his head and face being held out of the water the taxed life jacket doing everything it could to hold Boyd's torso towards the surface. Hey, Quint, are you married? Quint heard the voice behind him at the other end of the floater net. He turned to Machado, who was by himself, hanging onto the stray ropes of the net by Harold's head. Quint could see Machado's face, which was ghost white and his lips were shaking. Quint pulled himself along the floater net away from the other men who had all gathered around the opposite end to watch Boyd on his quest for the floating crate. As Quint pulled himself closer, Machado asked again, You married, Quint? You got a wife back home? The question took Quint aback at first, and he wanted to ignore it while glancing back at Boyd, who now struggled against a swell in a continued swim off in the distance. Quint turned back to Machado to answer, Not anymore. I was married twice. This last one didn't go very long. When we got back to port on this last go-around, she was gone. Quint leaned in and looked at Machado. Machado's eyes had become glassy and unfocused. His movements all carried a slight tremor of frailty to them. Quint pulled himself closer to listen to the shaken man. Then you and I are alike. I don't have anybody waiting for me, except maybe my mom. She's back in Cape May. I was supposed to write her back in Frisco, but this led to that, and you know how it is. We were back on the water, headed out to sea. Machado reversed his grip on the edge of the floater net and pulled himself closer to Quint. His voice dropped even lower. Do you know what my mom said to me before I left for boot camp? Quint just stared back in a concerned way and just listened. She said, Clarence, you should have joined the Air Force. Machado let out a laugh and then winced with pain. Quint smiled but stayed silent in response. He felt something was wrong. Quint looked back to check on the others. Twenty feet away, Troy Boyd ran out of line just ten feet from his crate. He turned and looked back at the floater net off in the distance. It seemed as if it was a mile away. It took so much out of him to get this far. Boyd looked down at the end of the line in his hand and released it, letting the knotted end float on the surface of the water. He turned and continued for the crate. Hodge, huddled with the two Marines down by Harold's feet, yelled out while watching Boyd. He let go of the line, damn it. You crazy kid, forget it. Get back here. Quint heard the shouting and went to turn away, but Machado reached out and grabbed the collar of Quint's life jacket. Listen, I don't want the other guys to know. I didn't want to scare them. Machado stammered his words as he looked down 
and held up the tattered remains of the front of his life jacket. When he did this, the water in between him and Quint turned a shocking red. Quint could see down into the surface of the water. Machado held his stomach closed with his free hand. The lower jaw of the attacking shark had taken a part of his abdomen along with the front side of his life jacket. Machado felt no pain through the attack. He still couldn't believe his eyes as he looked down to see the shreds of muscle and skin leaking blood from the missing pieces of his body. Quint looked around to see what he could patch up the sailor with, or maybe get him to the main floater net back at the center of the group just to the north of them. Machado reached up and grabbed Quint's life jacket and pulled him closer so he could whisper, No, no, don't tell anyone. I don't want them to know. I'm so thirsty, Quint. I just want to drink something before I die. So I'm going to go down there and have a drink. It will feel so damn good. Better than the finest whiskey in town. And I don't want you to stop me. Just do this one favor. For me. Just this one thing. Machado reached into his jacket and pulled his identification tags up from his jacket collar and over his head. With his bloody shaking fingers, he reached over to Quint, placing them in his hand. Quint was silent as he took the shiny metal tags and chain. Make sure these get to my mother. I have nothing else left. These are it. If you could do that, I would be very grateful. Quint just nodded his head, for he had no words. Ten yards away, Boyd reached the crate and grabbed it. Up close, it was a lot larger than it looked from back at the floater net, and to his surprise, it held him up when he pulled on it. He floated with the crate for a few seconds and looked down. He thought he saw movement between the gleaming knives of white sunlight streaks reflecting off the ocean's surface. With all the strength left in his body, he held the crate in front of him and kicked with his feet pushing it back towards his floater net group. Boyd saw the end of the survival line floating in the water just ahead of him. He reached out and grabbed it, then called to the men while raising his hand holding the line. The line went taut and pulled. He wrapped it around his forearm twice and then hung in the water and felt the tug. Back at the floater net, the two Marines joined with Eastman and Jack in pulling Boyd's lifeline hand over hand. Quint could hear the commotion but didn't turn away from Machado. Look, there's got to be a better way than this. Maybe we can get you to Dr. Haynes and... No, no. You know this is the end of the line. Machado grew calm with his explanation. Them sharks will smell this blood and come for me first and take the rest of you with me. Might just happen this very minute, and I don't want to die thirsty. This is the only way, and I'm not mad. I'm really not, Quint. I'm so thirsty. I heard the further down you go, the less salty it is. It tastes like a fresh waterfall. I'm so tired, so thirsty. It will feel great, Quint. I promise you, this is what I want. Machado leaned back from Quint and pulled on the front tie string of the torn and tattered life jacket. Quint looked back to call for help from the others. Just as he looked away, Machado closed his eyes and slipped out of his destroyed life jacket in silence. His oil-covered face sank below the surface. Quint froze at the sight of the translucent arm reaching up from the water, the hand still holding tight to the floater net. There was a pause. In the morning sun, the salt water acid-bathed skin of Machado's forearm glowed and the dark lettering of the black tattoo ink stood out in stark contrast. The letters USS Indianapolis, USN, over a detailed bald eagle with its powerful wings extended stared back at Quint and burned into his mind. Quint watched the hand release its grip. The tattooed ghost-white forearm of water tender second-class Clarence Machado, without further hesitation, dropped from the sunlight. The four men pulled on the survival line with weakened and fatigued shoulders. An exhausted Boyd, kicking and holding on to the wooden crate, arrived at the net. The mission was a success. Boyd swore the sharks bumped him twice and they joked about him being the largest damn worm on a hook them fish had ever seen. Even Harold Shear, who laid in pain on top of the floater net, jostled back to consciousness by the unusual laughter and anticipation of the crate Boyd had salvaged. The crate measured three feet in length and rose two feet from the water's edge. Made of fresh, solid southern Georgia pine, the crate sat right on top of the water. The wood carried such a robust buoyancy that Boyd could hang from it, and the crate would only drop six inches. Boyd found a few weakened boards at the upper corner and reached in. The smell of rotten vegetables caused his stinging eyes to widen. All right, boys, dinner is served! Boyd yelled and whooped in a hoarse and weakened voice as he pulled out black, rotten potatoes. The salt water had rotted the potatoes' exteriors into a putrid black jelly of foulness. But upon further inspection, a desperate and starving Boyd scraped off the black slime to find a gray, solid inner core. He took a bite and chewed as if he just bit into a prize-winning slab of Texas beef back home. With no hint of self-preservation, Boyd reached into the crate, exclaiming, 
the fact that these were the best potatoes he had ever eaten. He pulled out the black and brown balls of rotten slime and tossed them to the men who all ate something for the first time in over 100 hours. Boyd flipped a potato over to Hodge, who moved down on Harold's right side. He broke off pieces to feed to Harold, who laid still while relaxing his fire-damaged arms. Quint was relieved to hear Boyd had reached back to the group, but still couldn't look away from the torn life jacket that drifted in the cloud of blood Machado left behind. Boyd, using the crate as a floating support, pulled himself along the edge of Harold up to Quint. He held out a less rotten black potato that he reserved for his superior. Machado, Boyd asked, looking at the space along the net where Machado once was. No, Quint said while shaking his head. Quint accepted the offered potato from Boyd. He ate while staring at the gray clump of torn life jacket. It drifted away to join the other floating mementos of lost lives littering the surrounding ocean. That was chapter 6, page 41 to 48 from the Book of Quint. There's still time to join the exclusive club of the Book of Quint. Campaign backers over at Indiegogo.com. Follow the links at JawsOB.com, BookofQuint.com. By supporting the campaign, you will be able to get a copy of the Book of Quint. And if you like that reading and you want to hear more, if you have any comments on that, just give me an email over here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. You also can contact me over at our Telegram channel, jawsob at telegram.com. I'd like to thank everyone for sponsoring the campaign and helping us reach our goal. Um, This has been a two-year project, and we're working hard to bring it on home. So... With good fortune, we're going to keep pushing on here, and I'm going to get back to doing some more writing. Thank you very much for tuning in this week uh, for episode 27 and the reading from the Book of Quint. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Have a good week. Farewell and adieu.